Tonight on KQED Newsroom, we have an Earth Day special episode. According to a report by the Environmental Integrity Project, thousands of pounds of chemicals are flushed out of oil refineries directly into the San Francisco Bay. Advocates say the pollution is deforming fish and harming communities and the ecosystem. We consider the implications. Plus, California and Mexico City are signing an historic sustainability agreement. The Secretary of California's Environmental Protection Agency, Yana Garcia, tells us what it means for our future. And for tonight's Something Beautiful, travel with us to Urban Tilth, a beloved community garden in Richmond that's working to build a more sustainable food system. Coming to you from KQED headquarters in San Francisco this Friday, April 21st, 2023. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Priya David Clemens. Tomorrow is Earth Day, an annual event that traces its roots back to California. In 1969, at a UNESCO conference in San Francisco, peace activist John McConnell proposed a day to honor the Earth and the concept of peace. A year later, the first Earth Day proclamation was issued by a San Francisco mayor, Joseph Alioto, on March 21, 1970. On a sunny day, when the fog has lifted and the San Francisco Bay sparkles, it's easy to think our land is pristine and our water is pure. But a recent report from the Environmental Integrity Project found that 81 refineries in the U.S. discharged concerning amounts of pollutants into our waterways, including some right here in the Bay Area. We're joined now by San Francisco Examiner, climate and environment reporter, Jessica Wolfram. Jessica, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So tell me what this report means for the health of our water here in the Bay. Yeah, so this report lines out data that shows that half a billion gallons are of wastewater from these refineries are getting dumped into waterways across the United States every single day. And that includes refineries here in the Bay Area, including Phillips 66, Chevron, Valero, and, uh, and the refinery in Martinez. Um, and I think the most stark findings of this report show that while refinery businesses have increased over the last decade, the regulations that oversee how much they can discharge and what they discharge haven't changed since the 1980s. Um, and that's true even for chemicals of concern that are emerging you know, well after that, including microplastics and PFAS, which are used broadly across industries from nonstick plant pans to, to your raincoat. So none of the newer chemicals are really being regulated. And it sounds like even the regulations that have been on the books are not particularly strong and they're not being enforced. Why is this? That's right. Well, I think you have to ask the EPA, you know, exactly why, but the report lays out that the EPA has routinely failed to regulate even the regulations they have on the books now, and I think that would make enforcing any stricter permitting at this time near impossible. Mm, okay. We did reach out to the refineries to get a response, and, you know, Chevron sent one back that said in, in Richmond they disputed the accuracy of the data in this report and they pointed us to Cal EPA's data. You know, it's, it's hard to know what's spin and what's true. Do you have any concerns about the data in the EIP report? I think it's important to say that the Environmental Integrity Project is a nonprofit adv advocacy group. They're focused on investigating big polluters, everyone from coal plants to uh, factory farms to these refineries. And so that's an important, you know, I think that's important to keep in mind when reading this report. At the same time, the Environmental Integrity Project was started by two former EPA attorneys who really do have insight into the sort of inner workings of that agency. And the other thing I will say is that while I can't can't speak definitively to the discrepancies between the data uh, from the EPA to the Cal EPA to what Chevron is saying. Um, if you look around the Bay, groups, scientific groups and, and environmental groups like Baykeeper who monitor the health of the Bay, who take water samples every day, are finding uh, pollutants including nitrogen, selenium, heavy metals, nickel, uh, things that are being dumped not only by these industries but by our urban settings as well. Yeah, so in your reporting you found that this is not just a concern for the refineries in terms of the pollution that's going into the bay. There are many other industries that ring the bay that are dumping toxic chemicals into our water. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to note that it's not just the refineries, and I think they can often get a bad rap, but it's, it's 
industries across the Bay Area. You know, I grew up here, and it wasn't until I started reporting on this that I realized just the scale and scope of the industries that are located right on the waterfront. That's concrete cu crushing plants, landfills, um, you know, you name it. And so uh, even, you know, I think this was put into real uh, crystallized for us this summer when we saw the algal bloom in the bay caused in part by all the nitrogen pollution that's going into the bay. And we're flushing our toilets every day and in contributing to this nitrogen load in the bay as well. So it's, it's not just the refineries. We all have a part to play in keeping our bay healthy. But we should keep flushing the toilets. <laughs> we should keep flushing the toilets, yes. <laughs> so are you saying that the water just needs to be cleaned better? Yeah, I think scientists will say, especially with the changing climate and warmer temperatures, that, you know, it's not good enough in California, which is a drought prone state, to conserve water anymore. I think it's really time, or they will say it's really time to, to look into other technologies, including water recycling and uh, more advanced treatment methods. Mm. So tell us about those who like to swim in the bay, sail in the bay. Is it safe? The short answer is yes. I think the, the bay is such a resource and such an asset to this region, and we should all feel safe and enjoy it, though the, the California state and regional water boards, you know, are regulating the water and will tell you if things are not safe, like as they did when we were experiencing the algal bloom this summer. Uh, so if you're a swimmer or a surfer or a fisherman and you want to go out in the bay, I think it's safe to enjoy it. Um, and it, it should be said that, that the bay has come leaps and bounds from the 1970s. You know, before the Clean Water Act was passed, we didn't even have real sewage infrastructure or the money or, or the sort of outfitter that helps the Bay stay healthy now. So yes, I think we've seen broad improvements, but um, it's also clear that with a cl changing climate, we may need to take further action to keep the Bay healthy and safe. All right. Jessica Wolfram with the San Francisco Examiner. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me and happy Earth Day. Thank you. Let's turn now to community members and activists who are raising alarm bells on the impact of pollutants in our waterways. Joining us now to discuss these findings and more are Sejal Choksi Chu, Executive Director of San Francisco Baykeeper, and Merisol Cantu from the Richmond Listening Project. Thank you both for being with us. Thank, Thank you. So Sejal, let's start with you. As Executive Director of SF Baykeeper, what was your response to this report? The report really demonstrated that the refineries around San Francisco Bay are causing a huge impact to San Francisco Bay and our local communities. And Baykeeper has been following the refineries for many years, decades even. What the report did was really combine all of the data and the information and show in a really expose kind of way all of the impact in a cumulative manner. And we just got really upset seeing how the technology needs to be improved and EPA has just been sitting on its hind legs not doing anything about this refinery pollution for decades. Why is that, do you think? Uh, so there's a lot of pressure on uh, uh, on the agencies from the refineries, from refinery lobbyists to try to keep everything kind of uh, business as usual. So some of these technologies are from the 1980s that they're still using to try to control pollution at these refineries. And it's just not working anymore. We have new technology. It's like the time when we were before cell phones. That's the same kind of technology that they're using right now. It's way, way outdated. And they really should be removing these pollutants from their wastewater streams because they're having an impact on the environment. Hmm. Let's talk about how, how bad it really is, right? So, Merisal, you've been tracking regulatory violations, yes. specifically by local refineries. Can you tell us about some of the recent incidents and fines that have been leveled? Yes, absolutely. They are some of the most law-breaking refineries that we have in the state of California. Um, just in the last three years, Chevron, that is in my community, Richmond, flared over 50 times creating black smoke in our communities, in our cars, on our playgrounds. We also can look at, over the last three years, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District that regulates our air has had over 400 notices of violations at the different refineries. Most recently, uh, we had the Benicia uh, Valero refinery that was given a $1.2 million penalty. This is to a multi-billion dollar corporation. This is not actually go to the communities that it harms. It doesn't go to 
protective care for the community. It actually is, it's disrespectful to the communities that live right there and are seeing the causes and the health impacts directly. Um, and then, of course, most recently in Martinez earlier this year, communities were told not to eat any of the produce for four months that had been grown in the, in the Martinez area uh, because of the facility emitting 20 tons of dust that was a fine white powder dust over, again, schools, over homes, over um, playgrounds as well. And so the impact for us is every day. It's real. We have young children being born with some of the highest asthma rates in Richmond, one in four children. And your own brother um, suffered from that as a child as well. Yes, absolutely. I watched my baby brother um, born with asthma, needing to go through breathing treatments. We're truly fighting for the right to simply breathe. And I think that's what we need to hold our refineries and our local regulatory and even federal accountable for, because for us, it's a, really a matter of life and death. You've been involved with the listening project in Richmond. We pulled a clip from that. And in this, you have voices from the community talking about yes. how these different types of pollution are impacting their lives. So let's go ahead and listen to that. Thinking about Chevron, you know, like it, it's it's literally life and death. Um, maybe not so much like in terms of like the time frame, if you think about it that way. But, you know, I think about like my daughter is very young. And if she's experiencing, um, if she's being exposed to all these environmental pollutants, that's affecting her, um, that's affecting her genetically, and it's also affecting, you know, her experiences in her environment. How often are you hearing stories like this? Far too often. This has become normalized. People uh, growing up, young people having asthma, needing to have a different type of PE class. Mayor Eduardo Martinez, uh, who's our current mayor, was a teacher, created an asthma club, if you will, for his students that couldn't actually meet the PE standards in schools and needed to work with counselors and social workers to better understand how to create a problem. This has become so normalized in our community. and. It's been over 100 years that Chevron has had a stronghold on our communities and many of these refineries for decades long, like Sajal has been saying. It's, it's far too often than not at this point. And in our Listening Project podcast, we also heard a mother say, it, and actually a doctor, Dr. Amanda Milstein say, parents come to her asking when they'll find out about asthma, not if. Mm -hmm. It is more of a question of when. And this is what my brother, who's now an adult, asked in our fourth generation. When will I know? When can I test my son to see if he is going to have asthma? That should not be normalized, and in particular in any community. But right now, the hardship really is on black and brown communities. Right. So, Sajal, you're seeing this, too. I mean, across the Bay, not only in Richmond, that these issues of environmental pollution typically impact disadvantaged, vulnerable communities. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, San Francisco Baykeeper looks at all of the industrial facilities around San Francisco Bay in all of our communities. We review all of their pollution data every single year. This is self-reported data that's required under the Clean Water Act. Oftentimes, agencies are taking that data, putting it in a drawer and ignoring it. And we are pulling it out, dusting off all of the, the dust and, and taking a look at those really carefully. And we're holding those polluters accountable. And so the refineries are at the top of that list almost every year. And when you say you're holding them accountable, you've filed lawsuits. Yes, we, we are litigators. We do sue these companies when they are violating the law and when the, the agency refuses to take action and enforce the law. Okay. Let's talk, we've talked a lot about the pollution in the air as well. Let's go back to the pollution in the water. I want to read some of the numbers about how much is being released into our waterways. So, a thousand pounds of selenium, a million pounds of total nitrogen, 32,000 pounds of oil and grease, more than 500 pounds of arsenic, 
270 pounds of lead and lead compounds, nearly 200 pounds of cyanide, and 140 pounds of hexavalent chromium. I'm not even sure exactly what that is, <laughs> but obviously a problem. Is there a particular one among all of these that is most concerning to you? Yeah, I mean, they're all concerning. Pollution in the water, pollution in our communities should not be there, especially from these refineries that are supposed to be responsible stewards. They're supposed to be operating cleanly. So they've got tons of pollution coming out. And as you're mentioning these numbers, these are all annual pollutants. And uh, one of the ones that we're really concerned about is selenium. Selenium has been shown to have human health impacts. It's been shown to have wildlife impacts. And we've got the Martinez refinery, whose permit was just approved by our local water board. This is Cal EPA, approved their permit in 2022 to allow 875 pounds of selenium to enter San Francisco Bay every year. And that is the same number that they have been discharging into the Bay since the 1980s. So that has not changed changed at all, even though technology has improved and they could stop stop polluting selenium. And there the is a very visible link that you all are pointing to between selenium and the wildlife, particularly in a fish. Yeah, this is the most frustrating part of it. The new data that's coming out is showing that wildlife is being deformed. So the California Sacramento split tail fish is a fish that's endemic to San Francisco Bay and the Delta. And it's being impacted directly by these uh, selenium discharges from the refineries. The, the scientists have shown that it is the refinery selenium in the water that is causing these deformities in these fish. And the agencies, instead of taking that science into account, they're just turning a blind eye to it, even though we are putting it in front of their faces and saying you need to update these permits and not allow selenium to discharges anymore from their refineries. What would you like to see change here in California <laughs> for us to have cleaner waterways? Well, uh, first, we need to move towards a just transition. I imagine our communities without refineries. We need to move away from extractive economies and into regenerative economies. Solar, wind, how is technology at a place now that we're still uh, refining at a 100 year refinery and polluting this? We're in 2021, how many more generations will have to live through the impacts? And we really need communities and workers at the helm. And it's unfortunately gotten to the point where our communities will continue to have to hold our local government agencies accountable as well as a refinery. But it's only done with workers, community members, all together, and hopefully with the help of some folks in Richmond, like the Richmond Progressive Alliance, that are really trying to fight against some of our, our biggest polluters, which is Chevron. All right. Marisol Cantu with the Richmond Listening Project, Sejol Choksi Chu with SF Baykeeper. Thank you both for being here and for sharing your knowledge with us. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. We're taking these concerns to the top environmental protection representative in the state, Cal EPA Secretary Yana Garcia. Garcia has been in Mexico this week. This morning, she signed a memorandum of understanding between the state of California and Mexico City. This year marks 200 years since the start of diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Mexico. Secretary Garcia joins us now by Skype in Mexico City. Secretary Garcia, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me again. Good to see you. The report from the Environmental Integrity Project found that federal standards for refineries haven't been revised since 1985. Should those standards change? Well, you know, Priya, we've, we've long considered the national standards for refineries to be out of date and insufficient, really since the 80s. And we'd welcome federal action to strengthen these standards. But I think that in California, we've taken the, on the responsibility to protect our waters and don't wait for the federal standards. So to protect the San Francisco Bay, for example, the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board has long included water quality-based requirements in its permits that we issue that are significantly more stringent than the federal standards. These include limits on toxicity and selenium limits that are set by the board in order to make sure that we're actually protecting the delicate ecosystem of the bay, which we know needs protection and a lot of improvement 
improvement, frankly. The bay has suffered, um, and we need to make sure that we're protecting it as much as we can. When refineries don't comply with effluent limits and other permit requirements that we're setting in places like the Bay Area and elsewhere across the state, the regional boards have quite a bit of discretion to take enforcement action, to pursue penalties, and to pursue referrals to the Attorney General's office. I take that enforcement action very seriously. I impart that on our boards and departments, including the Water Board and the Regional Board. So advocates we've spoken with say there's just not enough enforcement and that at the end of the day, the enforcements that there are for violations amount to a slap on the wrist, that there should be heavier fines and penalties. And they also point to concerns with wildlife, such as deformities in fish and health concerns for communities that live along the border of the water. What are your thoughts on this? Do you think there should be more enforcement, even with Cal EPA, than there is right now? Hmm. I think our enforcement can be strengthened and should be strengthened. Um, and I think our standards also need to change um, in certain instances. So one of the things that I've coupled with the goal of strengthening our enforcement, and in particular multimedia enforcement, so that when we're sending folks out to look at air emissions issues or air quality impacts, we're also aware that oftentimes when we see one media of impacts, we'll also see another media of impacts. So we're also sending out those who are inspecting waste discharges affecting water bodies. Um, is that we also have to start regulating, continue to regulate toward toxicity that affects the most vulnerable Californians and the most vulnerable species. We should not have levels of toxicity that are affecting fish species. And I know that's long been a concern for many folks around the Bay Area, and that shouldn't affect our communities. I also want to note that we're actually looking at different ways to leverage higher penalties on the oil and gas industry overall for much of the work that they've been doing to harm Californians, not just from the climate standpoint, but also also in their pocketbooks. And this is no secret that it's been a, a priority of the governors and of the legislatures in the special session most recently to look at penalties for price gouging. But we also have to look at our penalties overall for environmental standards. And I strongly believe that these should be set as strongly as possible and that we're taking all the enforcement action that we possibly can when we see violations. The refineries that we're looking at are also, frankly, transitioning. We're transitioning away from fossil fuels across our transportation sector. And I think that's another important element of our agenda and our plan to comprehensively transition to a carbon neutral economy. Let's turn now to the MOU that you signed earlier today. Tell us about what it will do and what we will see as an impact here in California or in Mexico City. Yeah. So it's been a really exciting couple of days, uh, particularly for me. I'm a second generation Chicana. I have Mexican roots and I was the, had the privilege to be joined by so many elected officials who have the same background and a lot of folks who understand that the importance of our binational relationship with Mexico in particular is critical. They're our closest neighbor um, from the international standpoint. And we think often of the partnership with states like Baja California as being particularly critical, but Partnerships with municipalities are also really important, and other subnational governments are also really important. For many years, California carried the mantle on our Paris Agreement, and I think that created a lot of space for subnational governments to step up to the plate and be able to uh, commit to more ambitious climate targets um, and emission reduction targets, and we've seen that in many states across Mexico and in Mexico City. So we just signed a memorandum of understanding today that's actually a renewal of one that expired in 2019. And our teams have been working very closely. That is my team at the California Environmental Protection Agency, the team over at the Energy Commission, which is within the Natural Resources Agency, to really make sure that we're partnering with a city like Mexico City that shares so many challenges in common with California. They've had some of the worst air pollution for several decades and have made great strides and improvements in providing zero emission vehicle transportation options for their residents, in creating a truly circular economy that frankly we can learn from, um, and, and in, in ensuring waste reduction across the city, rainwater capture, stormwater capture, et cetera. So all things that we can impart our knowledge in and our leadership in, but also learn from um, and be able to ensure that our shared challenges are turned into opportunities for our binational communities, for those of us who come across the border, um, often for industry, for jobs, and we share the same climate. We share hundreds of miles of coastline with Baja California, for example, and we share a lot of the same concerns around drought, around wildfire, around climate resilience for our communities and the need to dramatically reduce emissions, particularly in the transportation sector and decarbonize our buildings. 
There is also a brand new website that has been launched from the state, and it's in recognition of Earth Day tomorrow, and it gives Californians an opportunity to find ways for action. Would you tell us a little bit about that tool? Sure. So that tool is really something that, um, you know, we've been pressed for some time to develop. Um, it's it's sort of a, an attempt at a one-stop shop. We've made incredible improvements in how we're delivering our investments to households. These are investments for electric vehicle rebates, for low-income weatherization programs, for home solar, um, and other types of energy efficiency programs. And we've long wanted to create a sort of central hub where all all Californians, but in particular, low-income families can be able to access information about rebates and programs that really respond to them and their needs and that allow them to be a part of driving the solution um, and seeing the resources that may be available to them. And the website there is climateaction.ca.gov. Yana Garcia, Secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good to see you. Urban Tilth was founded in Richmond in 2005 with the goal of making healthy, farm-fresh food accessible to all. They aim to build a more sustainable and equitable food system by working with local residents to grow and harvest their own food at one of their seven community and school gardens. Join us as we visit Urban Tilth for tonight's look at something beautiful. What a lush and beautiful place. That is the end of our show for tonight. We will see you right back here next week. If you'd like to share your comments or questions, you can email us at knr at kqed.org. You can also find KQED Newsroom online or on Twitter, and you can reach me on LinkedIn at Priya D. Clemens. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend.